Hey everybody, it's Kermit here. Gonna go fly my AT6 Texan and uh, I got my Kermit cam with me, so let's go for a flight. Alrighty, we're all set up. And uh, we'll just go ahead and uh, start here on the tip. We're gonna go ahead and take the pedo tube off. That keeps the bugs out. Mud daubers love to make nests. The chalk's out, looking for brake leaks. Um, any of the lines, everything looks pretty good. The guys have already sumped it. Uh, I still need to pull it through. And we always pull the uh, propeller through on engines that have low cylinders that point down so we don't get a hydraulic lock, which is uh, oil draining that's left in the engine down into the bottom cylinders. Of course, the piston goes up and down in the cylinder, and you got to make sure there's no oil in there because if it locks up, it then bends the connecting rod, and you can usually count on an engine failure within about 10 hours. Uh, if for some reason the cylinders do fill up with oil, uh, what we do is we take the spark plug leads off, pull the plugs out of the lower cylinders. It usually drains oil, makes a little bit of a mess. We clean it up, put everything back, and then we go. And everything looks pretty good here. Um, here's actually the fuel sumps. There's two tanks in this airplane. Smells like fuel. Of course, water is heavier than fuel. So the water goes to the bottom and comes out first. Okay, everything looks good here. No leaks. I gotta tell you, the uh, this, uh, this is an AT-6D, and this one actually had uh, two 30 caliber guns in the wings. This is where the ammo uh, casings would be kept after the gun fired. Um, but we don't have them installed. The controls are locked, so let me go unlock those so I can check the controls. It's a little thing right here down at the bottom of the stick. So we move that, and we can move the stick around. And uh, everything's off. So we're just looking for cotter pins and everything is uh, bolted together. Looking good there. This has uh, split flaps on it here. And uh, I have an indicator in the cockpit that allows me to see what the flat position is. Yeah, we're looking for fabric that uh, you know might be damaged or anything. Oh, something inside there. Probably Rosie the Riveter. Um, we keep an eye on the airplanes pretty good and they stay in the hangar so unless somebody wants to take some of the pins off tailwheel tire looks good. Everything's in good order. Uh, there's two fuel tanks in the wing and uh, each tank holds 55 gallons. Yeah, I think the engine, uh, 650 horsepower, burns about 30 gallons an hour. So we, uh, that's even 110. So you yeah, about two and a half hours of fuel you want to be, three hours you want to be on the ground. This uh, airplane's painted up in the colors of the WASPs, uh, Women's Air, Sur Air Force Service Pilots, and their training uh, base was in Sweetwater, Texas, and this is painted in the colors of the Sweetwater colors. This is Fifanella, that was their mascot, that was actually designed by uh, the Walt Disney Company in World War II. They did a lot of support for the war effort, doing training films with animation, and as well as uh, designing mascots. Now I went ahead and left the, let me put my pedo cover in my little special case right there. Glove compartment. I want to show you something in the back here. This is really cool. The first airplane Warbird that I ever bought was an AT-6 Texan. It was a G. This is a D model. I eventually sold the G because I had, uh, I just didn't have the hangar space at the time. I really wasn't collecting airplanes like I am now. 
But the D model was something that I really wanted. This can operate as a tail gunner a trainer as well. Uh, they used it as a ground attack gunner, you know, for training with the guns because it had uh, one gun each in the wing. It also had a 30 caliber that would stick out there. At some point, we need to put a gun in there and make it a little more authentic. This airplane came out of the uh, Spanish Air Force, and uh, I bought it. Uh, it came out in the 80s. They were, I think, the last government uh, to use them. Uh, and South Africa was one of the later ones as well. This is the greatest trainer that was ever built uh, for Air Force and Navy pilots, I think, and I'll point that out in a second. But what I wanted to show you back here is uh, the seat position sits back here. This is where the instructor would sit. As you can see, you can't see. And one of the greatest things about this for a trainer is if you can land this from the back, you can fly any of the fighters, P-51s, P-40s, P-47s. Of course, here's the stick. Now, this is very important. When I go fly, and I don't have somebody here, I always take this stick out, and it just clips right over here in that little position. It's locked in position. Now, check this out. The seat here, if you look down here, there's a little thing here. I push with my foot. And look at this. The seat actually spins around 180 degrees for use for gunnery training. But the reason I wanted this airplane, this is a great photo airplane. The photographer sits back here. It's a little un uncomfortable when the tail's low, but once it gets up level, it feels pretty comfortable. So this is uh, this is a pretty nice amenity because we do photos out of this. So I kick that with my foot, I turn it around, and obviously, anytime somebody's back here and they're turning that seat around, you do not want that stick there. You turn that stick around, or the seat around with the stick there, and you can't close it, or you can't, uh, can't pull the stick back, okay? So everything's locked in. We got the seat belts in. We go ahead and close the canopy in the back there. Get everything ready for the front. Find my seat belts. There they are. Organized. Got the left one on the right one. Okay, that's that. And of course, in the World War II airplanes, there's a bucket seat here, and the parachute is your cushion. This is such a great trainer. And one of the reasons is because. The landing gear is very narrow compared to most fighters, like a P-51 or a P-47. And of course there, you can actually see where the gear is. That's the gear indicator right there, that little white thing on the top there. Uh, I actually have a landing gear for each landing gear, the red things, and a flap indicator here. But uh, the one thing that I want to make absolutely sure is I look out there and make sure I can see that little white top. And if you look just to the left of it, there's the pin that actually locks the landing gear comes up. It, that pin locks in there, and I'm looking for that when I do my gear checks before I land. Um, so having a narrow landing gear makes it pretty prone to ground loop. And so if you can fly this airplane, the, uh, the fighters are going to be a little bit easier, especially if you can fly it from the back. Make sure that clips. And the other thing, why this is such a great trainer, is if you look out there, you can see that the, the, the leading edge of the wing is tapered back. It's got a little bit of a sweep to it. And what that does is if you get this thing uncoordinated in a turn at slow speed, it will snap roll on a dime. And so you really want to make sure that you've got the, uh, uh, you know, the, the slip ball coordinated when you're doing turns, especially slow. And the most deadly thing you could do would be to turn tight to get the runway low to the ground and the airplane will 
snap, we'll go ahead and zero the altimeter so I know where the ground is. Since we're just making a local flight, the control locks are out. Let me go ahead and get my helmet on here. Okay. Okay, so here's uh, pretty much the T6 cockpit. The uh, fuel selector is right here. It's in the off position. We always leave it in the off position. If you look down there, you can see that's my left fuel tank. The guys just filled it. I don't know if you can see the right one, but it's down there just below the floor level. And we always take off and land, or we always take off initially on the reserve. Now the carburetor actually has an overflow uh, system to it and what happens is the engine uh, pumps more fuel through the carburetor than the engines using and so whatever doesn't get used has a vent that goes back into the left tank so if the left tank and the right tank were full and we took off on the right tank at some point that would overflow and we'd start losing fuel at the left uh, vent uh, uh, tank vent so anyway so we always do that and I pretty much always take off on the reserve there's actually, uh, in the fuel tank on the left side, there's a little standpipe there. And what happens is, if you run it on just the normal tank thing, it ab actually uh, operates off of a little, uh, what do you call it, uh, a standpipe that goes up, and I think it's about 25 gallons uh, on the field. So, but if it's uh, operating off the reserve, it actually operates uh, the whole thing. So if for some reason you take off, and uh, you're flying along on the left tank and the engine quits, then uh, you just go to the reserve and it's got 25 more gallons, so it picks up off the bottom of the tank. Um, this, is a, uh, it does, this has a wobble pump. Sorry about that. Now this actually uh, doesn't have a uh, uh, electrical fuel pump, it has a wobble pump. So you actually pump this up and if I pump it up you can actually see the fuel pressure will begin to rise right here. So I actually have to wobble that and if for some reason the engine pump quits, I've got to start wobbling to stay in the air. Here's the throttle right here. This is your mixture. We always start an idle cutoff. We take off this full rich. And then at some point, you know, we'll bring it back a little bit to lean the engine out. This is the propeller uh, control. And the AT6 has a propeller that actually has a big piston up there. It's a hydro hydromatic prop. And what we always do to make sure the piston doesn't get rusted because it's kind of exposed is we always put the, uh, the propeller in coarse pitch when we shut it down. And uh, right now it's in coarse pitch. So when it starts, it's going to have a little bit of bite. It's going to kind of work along a little bit. Once I get the oil pressure up and I let it sit there for a little bit, I'll go ahead and push it forward. And you'll actually hear the RPM of the engine pick up a little bit as the blades go to a more fine position. So when I shut the engine down, I'll run the engine up, I'll decrease the prop uh, to coarse pitch, and then I'll go ahead and shut it off with the mixture. Uh, here's your trim. This is your uh, elevator trim, about neutral rudder's neutral. Uh, here's your landing gear right here, selector, uh, up and down. And as I said, I've got the selectors over here. Right now, they're obviously in the down position. Plus, I've got the pins in out here that I can see. Uh, here's your flap lever. And uh, it actually has a neutral position, an up position, and a down position. And of course, the flap position indicator is over there to the left of the landing gear indicator. And uh, this has, uh, the T6 has what they call a power lever. The hydraulic system is actually not on. Uh, it's not on all the time. There's not pressure on the system. So what you do is you push this little hydraulic pressure lever here. And when you push that, what happens is it pressurizes the system. Then you actually use it. And after you're done with it, after a little bit of while, you'll see the pressure go up there. What will happen is it'll, uh, uh, it'll go back and it'll go back to, uh, to zero. So uh, what I'm going to do here, there's a hydraulic hand pump right here. If I lose the 
pressure. I can actually pressurize the, uh, the system here. So let me go ahead and push the lever down, pressurize the system a little bit. So we're looking for the hydraulic pressure to increase over there. Okay, so I've got hydraulic pressure. Now watch, I'm going to go ahead and put the flaps down. And watch. Now I've got system C, so I can go ahead and push the flaps down by hand pumping it. It's kind of an emergency system, but when the engine's running, it's got a hydraulic pump. And then to go back up, I put the flaps in the up position, pump them back up for takeoff. And once they get to the end, I'll get some pressure, okay? And, it's, and then I go back to neutral uh, for the, uh, the flap position setting. Uh, this is your carburetor heat. We always fly with it cold unless we've got some icing. This engine doesn't seem to have a problem. Uh, here's the oil cooler. Uh, there's a shutter up in the front there to close the oil cooler. In Florida, we always just leave it open. You'd only use that in the wintertime up north when it was cold.